there have been two really interesting anniversaries uh, in November, for me anyway. The first, and I, I'm uh, very grateful to The Economist for pointing this out to me, was November marks the uh, anniversary, the annual day for International Toilet Day. So November is International Toilet Day. You may laugh, it's actually a very serious thing because it's about how do you improve sanitary conditions, uh, mainly in the third world, because lack of sanitary conditions is one of the things that leads to, uh, to death. And uh, the, the motto of the International Toilet Day is, we give a shit, do you? Which I think is the antithesis of the UK banking industry. Because I don't think the UK banking industry does give a shit, generally. Um, the second one I should share with you is uh, this day, actually on this day, in 1968, was the uh, formation of the Trades Descriptions Act. So 44 years ago, the UK introduced the Trades Descriptions Act, under which I could probably be prosecuted for the title of my presentation, which is Customer Acquisition Strategies for a Competitive Market. Uh, a, I don't think it's a competitive market, and B, I don't think there's anybody involved in customer acquisition strategies. What I think most banks are involved in is the acquisition of assets and liabilities. Put simply, they want your deposits because it's the cheapest form of funding, and they want your loans because that's where they make them, their money. By and large, I would suggest to you that the high street banks aren't particularly interested in you as a customer. So if this is about customer acquisition, I guess the first question we should ask is why should customers join the banks today, the high street banks of today? Well, I would argue that most banks compete on the wrong basis. Most banks believe that the thing that matters most to customers is rate or, or price. And I suggest that in every other market, price is not the determinant. You don't go out and buy the cheapest car. You know, if you did, we'd all drive Skodas. What you do is choose a car that suits you in your economic life cycle and where you are at that particular moment in your life. So it's not price that drives people or rate, it's value. What really cheeses me off is you walk down the high street and you look in the, the window of the banks, high street banks, and they'll say, we'll give you 4% on your current account. And you go, that's pretty good. I take 4% on my current account. And then you look at the small print, and it says, only on the first £2,000, and only for the first six months. And you have to transfer your primary current account to us, and you've got to give us a charge over your firstborn. Right, it, it might as well say that. It doesn't actually say that. I'd be unfair on the banks. Sorry, the reason I keep putting my glasses on is I wrote out my notes, but they're so small I can't read them without my glasses on, which is why I keep going back to, to do this. So what does value comprise? I quite like the bit uh, Charlotte said about uh, rational and emotional creates value. Um, I didn't like her bit about being most British banker. I would say that we in Metro Bank, with 100% of our assets and liabilities in the UK, are the most British bank. Um, and I would also say that I think we have a much higher T1 capital ratio, so we would claim the title for the most uh, stable UK, uh, UK bank. Uh, but I did agree with her on the point about value, rational and emotional. Value means many, many things to many different people. It's an amalgam of different things. So service is very important to people. Convenient is important to people. Convenience. Rate is important to people, but not as much as you'd think. According to the Office of Fair Trading, only 7% of people regard rate as the most important thing. For 93%, rate being there or thereabouts is okay. It doesn't have to be the best. It's just got to be fair. But it's also got to be transparent, and it's got to be consistent. And I think one of the mistakes a lot of people make in this so-called customer acquisition strategy is they treat new customers better than they treat their existing customers. So you will see all sorts of incentives to persuade you to move to a new bank. 
incentives that generally are not available to you as a customer of that existing bank. I think that's just wrong. You are not treating your existing customers fairly. You're not being transparent. You're not being honest with them. Um, our chairman made reference to um, ICES, current ISA rates. What is transparent about offering a 3% ISA rate, of which 2.5% is a one-off, one-year annual bonus, where the real rate is actually 0.5%, as you alluded to? That's not fair, and that's not transparent. So we want to acquire customers. We have to give them better value. So you have to put your customer first. What does that mean? What does putting customers first mean? Well, I would suggest to you it means not putting sales first. You walk down virtually every high street bank in the UK today, you walk through the door, and the person who greets you has a sales target. And the person behind the counter has a sales target. And up to round about a quarter of their income is derived from hitting these sales targets. And if they don't hit these sales targets, they will be having a very serious conversation with their line manager. <coughs> now, I'm from Newcastle, so I see things in black and white. And, oh, it's terrible, isn't it? I know. Um, but if you incentivize people to sell things, you set them targets to sell things, and you reward them for selling things, there is a fair chance that they're going to sell something. In Metro Bank, everyone you meet when you go in, and I hope you will, has one target only, which is that of customer satisfaction. They have no sales targets whatsoever. So how can you claim to put customers first if you actually put sales ahead of customer satisfaction, which is what most banks do today? <coughs> so it's about, for us, rewarding what matters. So for us, what matters is great customer satisfaction. Because our people are incentivized to give that, what we find is that we have around about 83% of our customers, sorry, 93% of our customers say they are satisfied or very satisfied with uh, the service that we give them. And 84% of our customers say that they would recommend us to a friend. Now, that's absolutely critical, because in the case of a small bank like Metro Bank, where we have a very limited marketing budget and customer acquisition is terribly important to us, this customer referral, is this customer advocacy is incredibly important to us. Because when we opened Metro Bank on July 29, 2010, we had no customers. Literally, we had no customers. So we are in the business of customer acquisition but we're in the business of acquiring customers, not their assets and their liabilities. Because we believe if you give customers a great service, they will stay with you longer, they will give you more of their deposits. But it's a byproduct of doing, of doing that well. Uh, I think the second thing around putting the customer first is letting them choose when, where, and how they want to deal with you. So we... Uh, the chair made reference to our bank branches. We call them stores. We don't think of them as branches. We think of ourselves as a retailer. So how do you make the environment attractive? When we were trying to raise capital to launch the bank, which was incredibly difficult and a story in itself, we'd go into private equity houses, long funds, VC, you know, the usual suspects, try to raise capital. And the first thing is they'd cross their arms and go, we don't like branches. And I'd go... We don't like branches either. They're pretty horrible, generally speaking. They're small, low ceilings, they're dirty, they're not very well looked after. As a retailer, we want big, nice environments that people want to go in. So we have always take corner sites. We compete with retailers for sites, not banks. We have very high ceilings because it creates that sense of retail theater. And we over-invest in the environment to make them nice places to go. Well, why? if, as everyone would suggest to us, the future is digital? Well, I think there are two answers to that. Firstly, again, according to the Office of Fair Trading, nine out of ten new accounts that are opened are opened in a physical location. So physical locations are important. Secondly, post the banking crash, people like physicality. 
The reason that uh, Ice Save went bust wasn't because it didn't have the liquidity to meet its immediate customer demands. It went bust because their website went down, people couldn't access them, and they panicked. What then happened, of course, is the Icelandic robbers took all of the, the cash out of the UK, which is why they went bust. But at the time, they were okay. It, wasn't, it was the lack of physicality that was one of the problems. People like stores. They like physical locations. Not all the time. This is my point about you, the customer, should choose how you want to interact with us. So we have uh, great telephony. We have a human being. Remember them? Human being answers the phone. None of this press one for yes, two for no, three when you lose the will to live. Um, and we have a great internet and a, a on, just coming on soon a, a uh, mobile banking solution. All of which are important to people, but they should choose the channel that suits them. We as a bank should not be driving them down a channel simply because it's more cost effective uh, for us. So let them choose how, when and where they want to deal with you. And then make it easy to join you. Um, I've got to be careful which card I get out here, because I actually am a, still, still a customer of First Direct, which I think is an excellent bank. And if it had branches, I think it would be perfect. Um, th this is my bank card. I think it's quite cool, actually. That's my bank card. And um, if you come to Metro Bank, we will open you an account in 15 minutes. You walk through the door, as long as you have a driving license, or proof of address and proof of identity, we will open you an account in 15 minutes. Within that 15 minutes, we will print you your permanent chip and pin debit card, your permanent chip and pin credit card. We can do all the ID and V in about 30 seconds in real time uh, online. And these are printed out in the store. If you want one, and people still do, we'll print you a temporary checkbook in the store with your name on it you can take out. So if you want to acquire customers, make it easy for customers to join you. Not you've got to make an appointment to come in next Wednesday, and if you haven't got the right ID, come in a week later, and then we'll send you your cards out a week after that. And then we've got to give, give people reasons to like you. Um, who's been into a Metro, Metro Bank store? Great, half, about half of you. Um, so I've got a bit of work to do. One of the things everybody knows about Metro Bank is that we say we like dogs. We have dog bowls and we have dog biscuits, and we welcome we welcome dogs. We also welcome cats. We welcome all pets. I'm not being <laughs> pettist, but we just happen to to do this particularly uh, for dogs. And I had a journalist say to me, in all seriousness, when we launched a bank, said. So, Mr. Thompson, you've raised £75 million to launch a bank. And your point of differentiation is you let dogs in. <laughs> uh, yep, you've seen through us. Absolutely. You know, we, raise, we raise all this money so we can have 50 pence dog bowls and about 50 pence worth of dog biscuits in every store because nobody could copy that, could they? But what it does say to people is if you can bring your dog into our bank and we don't mind if he pees on the floor or worse, which is what dogs do, then maybe we care more about you as a customer than we care about us as a bank. Uh, in every one of our stores, we have toilets, which are for use uh, by, not just by customers, anybody can use them. So you can come in, it's just helpful to know. If you've been to Starbucks, you know, we have a toilet in all of our, in all of our branches, you, which you can use. We've got baby changing facilities in them, because what we discovered was that mothers and sometimes fathers, but a lot of mothers do the banking during the day, and it was really, really useful for them to have that. We have coin counting machines. So most of the high street banks you go to, um, if they deign to take your change, they will insist that you bag it up in exactly the right amount. So your 101 pence pieces or 102 pence pieces or whatever. And of course, if they're not the right amount, Exactly right, they won't take them. And then if they do take them, they charge you anywhere between 9 and 11% for the privilege of taking your money from you. So in Metro Bank, we have these little coin counting machines. They're free to use. You put your coins in, get a slip of paper, you can put it into your account, or we'll give it to you in notes. Uh, you don't even have to be a customer. 
And it's really interesting, because I watch this going on. You'll see people sort of come in once and lose them. Then they'll come in a second or a third time, a bit furtively using the machines. And then eventually, you can almost see the light bulb come on over the head, which is, well, if they'll do this for me and I'm not a customer, what will they do for me if I'm a customer? So it's just about trying to make it give people reasons to like you and reasons to come in. And if they do like you, they'll recommend you, as I say, 84% of our customers do. And we must never forget that the acquired customer becomes the existing customer, and we really mustn't discriminate. I'm absolutely against discriminating on the basis of customer profitability. I really don't like customer profitability analysis. Um, and I'll give you a very simple but true example. Uh, we have a store on Kensington High Street, and a woman came in and she opened an account, and she was very happy with it. Uh, probably not a terribly profitable customer. She was uh, not the main breadwinner, so there was a limited amount of money going through her account. But she was really happy with us. And she went home and told her husband that how happy she was. And after a while, her husband opened an account with us. And her husband turned out to be the finance director of the U.S. Embassy. And the U.S. Embassy, um, every, I think it's every three years, might be five years, put their banking up for tender. And as a result of having been in and enjoyed the experience, he invited us to tender for, for the U.S. Bank, uh, U.S. Embassy Bank, which we, we won. I'm a, you know, we may not have won it. We just have, fortunately, we did. But we would never have got that opportunity if we'd said, oh, we don't, you know, we don't treat her quite as well as a, as a finance director of another business. If you treat everybody well, ultimately, we think the rewards will come to you. And that's really probably the final thing, main point that I want to make. I think one of the great malaise in UK PLC today, in general, and in banking in particular, is that people now think that they are in business just to make money. And all of the entrepreneurs I know, and I, I'd like to think of myself as an entrepreneur, Metro Bank is my third business, and next year I'm going to be launching uh, my fourth business. All the great entrepreneurs I know who have built businesses regard profit as a byproduct of doing something well for the customer, a better product, a better service, or a better experience. And I think that the UK, uh, UK PLC in general, banks in particular, have lost sight of this. They just think that they're in business to make money. We must never lose sight of the fact that we make profit as a result of doing something well uh, for the customer. I, I suppose my final, literally my final comment is about uh, what I said in my opening remarks about competitive markets. I don't think the UK market is competitive. <clears throat> Again, as, as our chairman alluded to the fact, about... 85% of the current account market is concentrated in six players. It's, it's in effect, an oligopoly. Um, I think the rules around uh, authorization and the rules around capital have restricted new entrants. It was a very difficult process for us to go through in Metro Bank, both in terms of um, FSA authorization, in terms of the amount of capital uh, we were required to hold. And when I had my rather cheap dig at... Uh, at Charlotte about our capital ratios. It wasn't by choice that we hold this amount of capital. It was a requirement of the, um, of the regulator as a new entrant. I think those rules are changing. I think uh, we will see, either in the autumn statement or in the early part of next year, a radical easing of the authorization process and a massive change in the amount of capital that new entrants have to hold. Um, there will be a challenge around that, and Andrew Bailey's acknowledged it, that in increasing the competition on the high street, in effect creating a free market, one of the byproducts of a free market is failure, and that some banks will fail. And providing customers' uh, deposits are not lost, providing the losses are borne by the shareholders and the bondholders, you know, which is in effect all of the risk capital, I don't think that's a problem. I think the key thing that will drive better customer outcomes through better customer acquisition, through better customer choice, is going to be more competition on the high street, which I think is going to come 
in the next year. Providing the new players and the existing players remember that profit is a byproduct of doing something well for the customer. Thank you.